Hello everyone, my name is Adriana Radulovic and I work at the Center for Biodiversity Genomics at the University of Guelph in Canada. During this entire training, you will be hearing a lot about different topics in DNA barcoding, but this talk will focus on the DNA barcoding workflows. Just to give an overview of this talk, I'll cover the main pathways in DNA barcoding that are present the workflows, and I'll also present what lies beyond DNA barcoding. DNA barcoding is very popular. It's been used for species identification for more than a decade already. You keep hearing about it in various places, and you are here because you want to learn about it or because you want to expand your knowledge. So I'd like to clarify something right from the start. The work that is being done in DNA barcoding falls into two main categories, reference libraries and applications. You either build a reference library or you use it. Or sometimes you need to do both, since these components are not isolated but intertwined. Most of you working in plant protection are interested in barcoding applications for your daily work, that is, how to identify plant pests based on DNA barcodes. However, sooner or later, you will be faced with a puzzle when your sequence of interest will have no match in the database. And that's because that particular species is missing from the reference library. So I think it is useful for you to learn how reference libraries are built and used so that you know what to do in case you would like to incorporate your future puzzle into the library. A reference library consists of DNA barcodes linked to biological specimens, which are stored in public institutions, specimens that were previously identified based on morphological characters by taxonomists. To build a reference library, you need to have specimens first. Then you need a group of taxonomists to put species names on those specimens. And in these days, when the number of taxonomists is in constant decline, this task might not be that straightforward. Then you need an analytical facility to process those specimens, to extract the DNA, amplify and sequence the barcodes. And then you need a database to store all the data and make it available to end users. Once the reference libraries are ready, they can be used for various applications, such as identifying pests, pathogens, invasive species, food fraud, or for biodiversity assessments in various geographic areas. And many of these applications are important not only for academic studies on biodiversity, but for human health and plant health and animal health. And this led some regulatory organizations to start using DNA barcoding as a tool for molecular diagnostic of species of concern. And you will hear more about the EPO standard from Bart and Marcel. How to learn about the use of DNA barcoding in a regulatory framework? Well, all of you are present in the Practibar workshop where you will learn just about that. In addition, um, at the University of Guelph, there is an online course given once a year it's called Regulatory and Forensic Applications of DNA Barcoding, and it was developed with support from CFIA, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency. Going back to building reference libraries or using them for applications, it is important to understand what a DNA barcoding workflow looks like. There are three major components, collection or the front end, then the molecular component and the bioinformatics component. The front-end component encompasses a multitude of steps, such as sampling and storing specimens in a DNA-friendly way, collecting geographic information for the sampling localities, together with additional metadata, such as the date of collecting, the name of collectors, habitat type, elevation or depth, sampling protocol, Details on the specimen itself, such as life stage, sex, associated taxa if available, the institution storing the vouchers for, for future reference, name and contact details of the identifier, and so on. Specimens go through an imaging step before being tissue sampled and sent to the lab. All the data accumulated in this component, in the blue one here, 
including images, is uploaded to a dedicated barcoding database, which is called the Barcode of Life Data Systems, or BOLD. And I'll talk about this database in a separate talk. This entire front-end component needs careful accumulation and manipulation of data and specimens to prevent issues further downstream, such as contamination between samples or sample mix-up or missing data, which will hamper the analytical part later. Once the samples are ready for the lab processing for the molecular component, the steps are pretty much straightforward provided that the taxonomy is known so that the appropriate protocols are used, especially for DNA extraction and then for the primers used for the amplification of the barcode region. Electrophorograms, which represent the raw data for sequence analysis, and then the edited sequences that are resulting from the electrophorograms are also uploaded to Bolt. As you will learn about the molecular and the bioinformatics components later during this training, I'll just take a moment to show you what the front-end part would look like in a high-throughput facility, such as the institute where I work, uh, Center for Biodiversity Genomics. And I'll give an example from insects, the taxonomy group with most barcodes to date. Insects are usually labeled and pinned in insect boxes as all of you probably know. In order to have the samples ready for processing, and since our lab works with 96 well plates, the samples are arrayed here in insect boxes that are already um, prepared with lines drawn to mirror the microplates. So each of these boxes would have some lines and then they would have the letters from A to H and the numbers from 1 to 12 so that you know where to put your specimen. Metadata regarding these specimens. Metadata is compiled in a spreadsheet and then submitted to Bold. Specimens are imaged and the images are submitted to Bolt. And then small pieces of tissue are placed into the wells of the microplate in the same order as they are in the insect box. Usually one leg is enough or even less than a leg depending on the insect size. So this microplate is sent to the lab for processing. The rest of the insect is then moved back in the general insect boxes for archiving. I've been talking about standard barcoding workflows, but now I'll show an example of a complex barcoding pathway, and this example is with ticks. Let's say you go out in the field and you collect a box sample, then you need to sort the ticks, then you put them in a microplate, and then you send the samples to the lab directly without taking images. Because ticks are so small, the whole specimen will go through lysis and DNA extraction, and then the exoskeleton will be recovered. The DNA will be used for standard barcoding protocols, which is Sanger sequencing. After that, the DNA plates will be stored at minus 80 in the DNA archive. Based on the results of the barcoding protocols, known taxa will be sent for storage in the archive, while the unknown taxa, the unknown ticks, would be imaged and then they would be outsourced for morphological identification and their sequence will be part of the reference library once the taxonomist would put a species name on those specimens. With the technological advances in next generation sequencing, and since the whole specimen was used for DNA extraction, which is not only a leg of the tick, but the entire body with everything that that tick is carrying, it is possible to use 
a next generation sequencing approach to identify the pathogens that are carried by those ticks. And these approaches will open the door for new opportunities in research and beyond. And with this, I'll move a bit to talk about technological advances. For those of you familiar with different molecular methods, you probably remember when RFLPs, restriction length fragment polymorphism, was used for diagnostic purposes. Then Sanger sequencing became popular and DNA sequences were used and are still used for diagnostics. And we are still here in the Sanger sequencing part for this uh, training. However, technology is constantly changing. The second generation of sequencing, which is called next generation sequencing, is becoming very popular. And it currently goes through a lot of discussions and testing, especially with regards to its use in a regulatory framework. But we already have the third generation on the market, such as the smart sequencing, single molecule real time. And the next few years will be very exciting to see all the outcomes. Just to quickly show the NGS part, a mixed sample can be processed as it is, uh, meaning mixed, it doesn't need to be sorted, by using the grinded biological material or just the storing liquid, which is filtered and then sent to the lab. Uh, the lab, no matter what NGS platform is used, uh, the lab will generate a large amount of data, and we are talking about millions of sequences. And this is the current bottleneck for NGS data processing because it requires supercomputers and skilled staff. A potential solution for those people who um, are not uh, very bioinformatics savvy would be Embrave, which is a user-friendly bioinformatics platform. And it's called Embrave Meta Barcoding Research and Visualization Environment. It was developed um, at the institute where I work, but by the same team that developed Bold also. And Embrave is to be released very soon in this winter, the winter of 2018. It will offer a multitude of analytical tools to be used by those who don't have a bioinformatics background, as I mentioned before. Now, with regards to the third generation of sequencing, um, our institute purchased the necessary equipment to move in a new direction and to start using the SQL instrument from Pacific Bioscience to generate standard barcodes. So the, the next years will be very exciting. Now to end, I will leave you with some data pertinent to your field. How are we doing on the past barcoding front? A dedicated barcoding campaign Cubo, the Quarantine Barcode of Life Network, ended in 2012. And the outcome was a very tangible one. QBank, which you, you will be using a lot during this training. QBank is the only database of sequences generated from curated material of regulatory interest. Which is all good, but now I'll show you a paper from 2013 from our group, the, the Hanner lab. And this paper looked only at the insect pests, so they didn't look at the other taxonomy groups. And they found that about half of the insect pests have barcodes in 2013. And this is to reinforce my point that you will surely stumble across unknowns when you do your applied barcoding work and you need to be prepared to cross into the sector of building reference libraries. Thank you.